Okay. So, <coughs> so today we are actually going to talk about something. We're going to be starting something, and I'm not exactly sure how long we're going to be talking about this. Um, but the reason is, is a couple weeks ago, I don't know if you guys remember this or not, or if you were even here for that week, um, Mark gave this really, really um, solid talk about the true vine. You guys were, I hope you guys were here for that, but he gave a really solid talk about the true vine. And um, when he spoke about the true vine, he talked about, you know, so who's the true vine? Christ. Okay, good. What are we? Branches. So, and, and, and it caught me kind of thinking, and then Mark and I were kind of thinking, and there's like so much to that. So we decided that we, we wanted to spend a little bit more time there. So I was researching about this a little bit while I was preparing for this talk. And, and here's the thing, while, while, Christ's, uh, while Christ was walking amongst, you know, the earth, you see in the beginning of the Gospels, when he was calling his disciples, what did he tell them? He would, he would go and he would basically make this command and he would tell them, follow me. Those were often the words that he used, follow me. But then there's this beautiful part of the Gospels, and I don't know if you guys have spent much time here, but... The gospel according to St. John is like a very, very special gospel. It was the last one that was written. Um, it spent a lot of time speaking about the divinity of Christ. But also more than that, there's like, there's like what I would call like the golden chapters, which is John 13 through 17. And that was, it picked up kind of like right at like um, the Last Supper. And it takes it all the way into like his, his betrayal. And what I love about this, when you flip through it in your Bible, you're going to realize that most of the words, words there, there are all in red, which is, you know, the very, very intimate teachings of Christ behind closed doors with his disciples when he knew that this was like some of his last moments with them before his, his betrayal and, and his, um, his crucifixion. So you can imagine, what would you be telling your closest people to you when you knew that that was pretty much the last time you had with them? So it's, it's beautiful. And in that time, um, he gave them a new word. And it was much more intimate, right, of what that union would look like between them. Because while he was walking amongst them, he can tell them, follow me. But after the cross, after the ascension, that wasn't applicable anymore, was it? There wasn't so much a way that you could physically follow him the way that, he was, that they were following him before. But he used the beautiful words, abide in me. So I want us to spend a little bit of time thinking about abide in me and what that means. So a fear is that maybe some of us here have never experienced that type of relationship with him. Because it is, it's a very beautiful relationship, right? It might even be the fact that we love God. We might trust God. We, we have a firm faith that he will forgive us our sins, that we recover by his blood. We will do our best to obey him. But we have never experienced this type of closeness that Christ is speaking of when he basically tells them, abide in me. So what would that look like? So when we start thinking about this, like what would that look like? It just makes the picture so clear when you look at this example he's using with the vine and the branch, right? Because the vine and the branch, it's a beautiful living union between the two of them. It would be experiencing his presence, not just on Sundays when we come like to his house. It would be daily, to be honest with you, hourly and uber honest with you, it would be like every moment. Because there is not a moment that the branch is not connected and receiving from the vine. You know, it would have to be constant. And you think about what our lives would look like if we figured that out. How we got to apply that into this constant state. And I believe that all of us would experience so much more. We would, we would find more purity. We would find more power. We would find more love. It would bring us so much more joy. We would be bearing fruit because wasn't that the whole purpose of the branch was to bear fruit? We would see blessings. And all of this would just be from abiding in him, being connected to him. 
we would literally feel the same way that that branch feels the power of the vine, the nutrients of the vine flowing through it. That would be how we would be living, feeling the fact that God was inside of us and that he was fueling us. So do you want to know the biggest challenge, or at least what I think the biggest challenge of abiding in Christ is? Is it takes time. It takes time. Have you ever planted anything? You know, is that, is that a quick thing? You know, I remember a couple years back, we were doing landscaping at our house, and we decided to put up some trees for privacy. And the guy convinced us, that do the smaller trees and they'll grow, right? The big trees are, like, way more expensive. So he says, if you just do the smaller trees, plant them, it, it'll grow. And was he right? Yes, they are growing. Are they growing as fast as I would have liked them to? No because it took way more time. And I think a lot of the times we, we, don't, we don't account for that because what we'll do is we will start trying to abide. <clears throat> but when we don't see the fruit, we don't see the growth, right? We all of a sudden, we chalk it up to the fact that it's not working and we just, we just give up on it, right? And I'm gonna say that if we wanna apply this principle into our life and we want to abide in him, we have to acknowledge and actually kind of like sign up for the fact that it's going to take time. And it's not just enough to spend a week just reading God's word, you know, to hear a nice message here and there, you know, just to do it when you feel like it, because that's not what it's going to take. But to truly abide in him, it requires time every single day. And not only does it require it every single day, the most important part of that is very much the consistency in, that, in which we do it. And if we were honest with ourselves, who heard that Jonah's fast is starting tomorrow? Did you guys hear Abuna's announcement there? Anybody else? Did it catch you off guard? Like it kind of like snuck up on you? And you're kind of like, and we're stressing out over about three weeks where we like, you know, a couple weeks after that, we've got like a long track, right? So it got me kind of thinking because I did actually remember Jonah's fast was coming. Um, but we all know that we require food every day, don't we? Like, if we were honest with ourselves, I, I can, I'm 45 years old. I've never remembered a day I went without food. On my busiest days, on my whatever days, on travel days, whatever it might be, not a single day will go by without food, even if the day's hurried. If you are packed all day long and you haven't had a chance to eat, right? When you finally do get a chance to eat, what do you do? You binge, right? Because you've got so much hunger that you basically stuff yourself with it, right? And that's almost kind of the way that I want us to pursue Christ, right? I want us to kind of think about Christ that we have to feed on him. And if you've had a busy day, if you've had a day that you are not connected to him, if, you're, if you had a day where you weren't thinking, you weren't this, you weren't that, you were preoccupied by, what, by whatever it is, when you get a moment, I hope that we binge on him, right? Just when we get that moment that we will be so hungry for him that we will want to feast. In John six fifty seven, which I think was today's gospel, it says, as the living father sent me and I live because of the father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. He who feeds on me will live because of me. And I wonder, what does that look like if we are not feeding on him? Right? And are we alive? We are. But I, my fear is that on the inside, we're dead. So it'll take time with Christ to abide in Christ. And I'm going to ask you guys something. And this is something so practical, but something that I feel brings so much fruit even in my own life when I do it versus when I don't do it, right? But before you read, while you read, after you read, do you pray? You know, or are we checking things off of a list, right? Before we open up our Bible, are we saying, God, I ask that you just give me eyes to see, right? Like, let me, let me understand what you're trying to point out here. God, I ask that you make my heart tender right now, that if there's areas of my life that you're gonna point out, that I will be receptive to it, right? That when we're done with praying and say, God, you know, I know exactly what you just told me to do. And I'm going to ask that you give me the strength and the courage and the, and the willingness to actually follow through, to walk according to the walk in which you called me. 
because that's what it takes, right? To put ourselves in constant contact with him, to yield to him. See, because you'll be influenced by him if you allow yourself to yield. But if you're not going to yield to him, then what is your intention with this book? What is your intention with our God if you have no desire to yield to him? Because the only way to be blessed by him is to yield to him. And if you give him that opportunity to take hold of you and to give him complete reign over your whole entire life, you will be blessed by it. And I fear that a lot of us are not living in the blessing because we're also not giving him the authority in our life that what he says goes and that he may reign instead of what we want to do. And again, I, I will tell you, I was thinking about this while I was preparing and I have, never reg- I have never met anyone who regretted that decision. The decision to say, you know what, God? My life is yours, right? Your statutes will be my statutes. Your laws will be my laws. And I'm going to do my best to like live in that. Because I will tell you, for those who answer the call of either follow me or abide in, uh, abide in me, you know, they have experienced that everything in this Bible is true. That... Where there's blessings, there's blessings. When there's disobedience, there's pain, right? Everything in this Bible is true. We learn that like he fulfills his promises and he is more than willing to make us partakers of his blessings, his joy, and his love. A hundred percent of the time, he is willing. You know, I love the story. Do you guys know the story when, when um, Queen Sheba came to Solomon? right? Because she had heard of Solomon's great wisdom and his great glory. And obviously, you know, I, it goes without saying, but was it Solomon's wisdom that impressed her? No, it was God's, it was God's gifts. It was God's beauty. It was God manifested in, in King Solomon that impressed her, right? But I love this because she had heard so much about the God of Israel. She had heard so much about this wise man, Solomon, And I love what she says when she gets there. It's in 1 Kings 7, 10. It says, however, I did not believe the words until I came and I saw with my own eyes. And indeed, the half was not told to me. Which is basically her way of saying, it was better than I ever expected. It was better than I ever imagined. And I am going to tell you that that is 100% true about abiding in Christ as well right? No matter what you think you may have heard, no matter what you think you may have seen, like when you are abiding in Christ, you know, there's Ephesians 3.20. It says that God can do abundantly, exceedingly more than you can ever even imagine. If you can imagine it, that already means it's too small, that God can do even more than that, right? And I believe that although she was talking about the glory of God, Um, in King Solomon, I am telling you that that statement that she said is true for every single person who is abiding in Christ. John 10, 10 basically says that I came and I came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. And I wonder how many of us are walking away from the more abundantly and we are settling for other stuff because we have not made the decisions that we need to, to abide in Christ. Because I fear that I might be saying this And you're sitting there thinking, Peter, that does not sound like what I'm experiencing. Or you know what? Maybe I experienced it for a short period of time, like in the beginning, but those days are over. It's not what I'm feeling right now. So the question is, is what's the disconnect, right? And the answer is simple. Could we have wandered away a little bit, right? Maybe we got distracted by other things. Maybe we got disengaged. Because again, the whole purpose of the abide in me, right? Like the whole catch of the abide in me is that blessings are offered to those who are connected continually, right? Like you still have to be a part of that branch. We can't be, we, the branch has to be attached to the vine. It's not like, oh, there's this one time when I was attached to the vine and it was great, but I'm not attached anymore because the second that branch that's, that gets disconnected from the vine, it loses all the benefits of the vine, every single one of them, right? So the abide in me is to only be enjoyed when we are in close fellowship with him. And it's either one of a couple things, right? It's either maybe we didn't understand completely 
or maybe we just didn't do it correctly. And I love it because I was going back and I was really kind of studying this whole abide in me thing. And it said that actually the better translation was come to me and stay with me. And I think that is a beautiful translation. Like come to me and stay with me because that's God's plan for every single one of us, right? It's not come to me and then wander off. That's why he's the good shepherd, right? Because his plan is even if you wander off, he's going to go after you. He's going to bring you right back because he wants you to come to him and to stay with him. Not just a sh short period of time. God's plan was never just to give you temporary joy, right? He wanted to give you his love, his deliverance, and to keep you, not so you can wander back off. And I'm going to tell you that he has a great life plan for us and for all of those who treasure him because the treasures are found in him. Um, but on the condition, again, where the union has to not be temporary. We cannot wander off. We have to be connected to him and we have to have unbroken communion with him. So the fact that each of us are here is a great sign. Okay, because of the fact that I can assume that every single one of us here at one point or another heard the call from God to come follow him, to come abide in him. And to be honest, we even made the decision that we would do so. Now, my question is, is do you remember that moment? Do you remember that moment where God's calling into your life was so real that you had to hear him? that you listened to him, that you followed him. You know, and I, I was trying to think that there's a couple different reasons that, that what might have brought you to him. For some of us, if we were honest, it might just be the fear of sin and the punishment that came with it. And we know that what's on the side of disobedience, and we just said we don't want to do that, so therefore we're going to come, right? For others of us, it might have been a blessing that was poured out onto our life, and the blessing in itself was so humbling for us that his goodness and his grace being poured out to us, we needed to respond. We had no other choice, right? Maybe it, was, it wasn't a blessing. It was just the feeling of love. Have you ever had that moment of grace where you just felt so much love just poured out on you and you knew that it was divine and it was such a warmth of love that you couldn't, you couldn't shake it off? And I was thinking of this because I think we all have those moments, right? And there's these strong moments, these strong memories that we look back at those beginning days that were so sweet. I, I often call it, it's kind of like your honeymoon period, right? Where the love is so intense. And I was reading this and, and it was beautiful. It said, the first drops of abiding in him, it gave us a taste of the sweetness, but it didn't satisfy right? Like the beginning was just enough to give us the taste, but it was never meant to satisfy us for the rest of the journey. The only thing that could truly satisfy our soul is drinking from the rivers of the water that are found in abiding with him. It wasn't something, it wasn't a one-time event that happened a long time ago. But the question is, is are we continuing in that so that we can continue to draw off of his love and off of, off of his beauty? And each one of us did the right thing by coming to him. But the richness, the depth, the, the real beauty, we don't get it at that entry point. We get it in the deep, right? We get it from where, when we stay close to him. You know, they have this beautiful example and it, it just, it hit home. Like, have you ever gone to somebody's house, right? You knock on the door and they open the door. And then just from the sheer fact that when they open the door, you can see there's so much beauty inside. Like you can just tell that that house is so gorgeous, right? Like maybe there's a view that you can see from like the front door, right? And you're just thinking like this house, like it, it just, it just captivate, captivates you. And the beauty draws you in, right? And then when you see that beauty, what's every ounce of you want to do? You want to go inside. Right? Like at that point, you're like, the door is not good enough for me. Right? Like my curiosity is peaked. My desire is peaked. I see beauty, but I want to walk in that beauty. Right? And, and can you imagine if that owner invites you in and basically says, come into my home and you stay at the door? 
Would that make any sense? Of course it wouldn't, right? There is no way you would enter into that house so that you could enjoy all the beauty of that house, all the richness of that house, right? I would want to take advantage of every nook and cranny of that home to enjoy all of the beauty. And there's a part of us where I feel like, you know, if we were honest with ourselves, like that could be us standing at the door right? Like we knocked on the door, the door was open, we saw the beauty, but we have not entered into it yet. We are not dwelling inside the house with the owner of the house who's made it all available to us. See, I, my worst fear is that we see the glimpse of the beauty, but we don't enjoy the things to come. And maybe it's because that we don't really understand what it means to fully abide in him. Um, and because of that, We haven't got there. We haven't experienced it because we don't understand it, right? Or maybe we love the idea of it, but we never believed it was possible. And maybe we never believed it was possible. And I'll be honest with you, like sometimes I don't believe it's possible because the air in the plan is me. Like maybe I can't experience that. Maybe I've got too much baggage. Maybe I've got too much sin. Maybe I've got this. Maybe I've got that. And like this abiding in Christ stuff might be great for the other guy, but like maybe I don't qualify for that, right? Um, Maybe it's our own unfaithfulness that kept us from enjoying it because we are not willing to stay close to him because meaning staying close to him means that there's a bunch of other stuff that need to stay away from. And maybe that's a cost that we have not been willing to pay because we're not prepared to give up some of those things. But the beautiful verse, John 15, 4, abide in me and I in you, right? Like that's an invitation from Christ to every single one of us here. In the coming weeks, we're going to spend time to really think about what that means, how we can live that out in our life, right? Not just be nice words and a nice invitation, but it's going it's it's to be something that we actually, we walk through and we figure out what's that going to look like. And a lot of the work in understanding this is going to be outside these four walls because we can dig into the scripture, but what it means for Peter is going to be different than what it means for Tom, what it means for Myrna, what it means for the other Peter, what it means for Daniel. It's going to look different for all of us, but we're going to lay out some of the principles for us to work it out. But then the hard work is going to happen in your prayer life when you're by yourself, basically asking God, what does this mean for me? Right? We're going to think about the message. We're going to think about the meaning. We're going to think about the lessons, the claims, the promises. We're going to understand all of that stuff. But it's going to be difficult because there's going to be distractions. There's always spiritual warfare. You have to acknowledge that. There's going to be challenges. And then ultimately, I think probably what might be the hardest part for some of us is there's going to be things that that we're going to have to give up to abide in him. But the best news is that Christ is willing. Not only is Christ willing, but Christ has a history when you look through this book here that Christ not only is he willing, but he gives you help along the way. Does he give you a help up front? Rarely, right? One of my favorite stories, and I think we talked about this in this meeting before, was like the 10 lepers where Christ basically said, go and you will be, go show yourself to the priest and you will be healed. And it says that they were healed along the way like on the way to the priest. So you can imagine these lepers standing there saying, how am I going to go my, show myself to the priest? I clearly still have leprosy. But Christ healed them along the way. And that's the same way that I believe that God's going to work in this meeting in all of our lives, right? When he is willing, but he sends his power along the way. And his Holy Spirit inside of us, working with us to guide us into that deeper relationship with him. Because no matter how bad you want this, No matter how bad you want to abide in him, he wants it more. And he is willing to do more than even you are willing to do to encourage you and to get you there. And the Holy Spirit is always whispering in our ears, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me. And he will continue doing that until it enters into our heart and takes root. So we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive 
into exactly what this means into our life and how we can live this out. And this will be something that I pray that we, that is something that is on your mind, not just on Sundays when we get together to talk about it. I hope this is something that we start praying about Monday through Saturday as well, saying, God, I want to abide in you. Show me how. Open my eyes. Encourage me. Make me hunger and thirst for righteousness sake. Let me look forward to my time in the Bible. Let me look forward to my time in prayer. I want to abide in you, and he will meet us there. You know, we will need to spend time at his feet. We will need to meditate on his word. We will need to fix our eyes on him. <clears throat> and on, on the same note, we'll also need to take our eyes off of some other things. Off of myself. Off of my really desires. We all know that we have sins that we need to walk away from. And what might be the, one of the hardest things are the things that have zero value or little value or benefit. St. Paul has this great um, verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and it says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. And another translation says, um, all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. And if you really think about what that means, how much stuff do we have in our life? It's okay, but it's zero benefit. And how much time that consumes from us, how much of our attention, how much of our desires, how much of all of that stuff, and there's actually no benefit to it. So some of that stuff might have to go. And I want us to develop a quiet trust on God where we're able just to sit in his presence and hear his voice. Because it's a still small voice. And I love the story of Elijah, right? Because that still small voice was mightier than the earthquake. It was mightier than the wind. It was mightier than the fire. It was mightier than anything else. And he still whispers to every single one of us. And if you're not hearing the whisper, you just might not be listening. <clears throat> you know, so I, I pray that Christ speaks to every single one of us in the coming weeks, starting today, to be completely honest with you, um, that we all hear his voice and that we feel our deep need for him and his love and, his, and, and everything he pours out for us. And there's this great quote I heard. It says, well, if you hear that whisper, if, if, if Christ is whispering to you, you have a decision to make. If you're obedient to that whisper, that voice, voice gets louder and louder and louder. And I think that's what we all want. Right? We want when Christ is communicating with us for it to be so clear that we're not missing it, right? Intentionally or accidentally, we just don't want to miss it. And our obedience will make that voice get louder and louder and louder. But I'm also going to tell you on the other end of that, if Christ, Christ is whispering to us and we are not obedient, what do you think happens? That voice gets quieter and quieter and quieter until it disappears. And I pray that that is far away from all of us. So I pray that in the coming weeks, when God whispers, that we will take advantage of that and be obedient so we can hear that voice get louder and louder and louder. And my prayer is, I don't know exactly how long we're going to be talking about this because I also know we got Lent around the corner, but my prayer is that by the end of this, we can all feel that we, are, we, that we can clearly, with a clear conscience, say, Lord, my Savior, I do abide in you. Amen? Amen. All right, let's stand up and pray. <clears throat> in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises, Lord. Honestly, we thank you that, that you even desire us to abide in you because we know that we don't bring a whole lot to the table, Lord, and we know that we disappoint and that we stray and that we wander off, Lord, but still that is your love and your heart that keeps pulling us back to you. So, Lord, I ask in these coming weeks,